it's been interesting watching the lockdowns that have been happening lately because there it's not just the lockdown, but it's also kind of like permanent um, quarantine hospitals being built, right? Permanent testing stations being built and like constant mass testing of people. And the question people have had about this is like, why are they doing so much testing? Like, why aren't they putting, you know, effort into vaccinating people, even with the, you know, even with the Sino farm vaccines or whatever that are not as that are not as good. But I think one of the things is, and this goes back, this is my hunch. I don't have a lot of data to, uh, you know, back this up yet. But I think this goes back to what you were saying, Andrew, about like people, people skills. Um, a lot of the people who are doing the quarantine management in China are migrant workers or kind of like temporary workers. They're not necessarily healthcare professionals, right? Like you can get, they, they're all wearing those like big white dabai suits. So like they all kind of look the same, but sure, you can train somebody to, you know, like put up fences. You can train someone to do a nose swab, but like they probably don't have the infrastructure to be able to quickly vaccinate a lot of people because they don't have enough healthcare workers to do it. Like you don't have to be a healthcare worker to do the mass testing, but probably to like be sticking needles in people, you know, even Chinese people would be like, if are you are you, if you're not a nurse, I don't want that, right? Yeah, they don't want some migrant worker yeah. jabbing them. Yeah. Well, the the the, pro the problem is that um, the pandemic has been so politicized in China more than anywhere else. Um, and then the narrative had been written that, hey, you know, we've got this under control early on. You know, we're, we're, the, we're the role model here. Look at the way we've managed the pandemic. You know, learn from us. And, of course, that's that whole scenario has done a 180-degree turn because, you know, in the West, um, we're, we're coming out of the pandemic and we've got on top of it largely through efficacious vaccines and other good measures. But it's funny, I, you know, I used to joke with a, a friend of mine, an Italian surgeon um, in Singapore, um, about, uh, you know, um, infections. And in fact, those plastic surgeons in Chengdu asked me, you know, how, what's the best way of reducing post-operative infections? And, you know, I, you, wow. you, you go into an operating room and um, you just see these guys are not practicing good aseptic technique. You know, they cut corners. And I joked with my surgeon friend, um, you know, it's because they can't see, they can't see the bugs, you know? The micro microorganisms are not visible to the human eye. So there's a tendency to cut corners. Um, some countries better than others in handling um, post-operative infections and no scrumial infections, which are hospital-acquired infections, than others. And it revolves around good discipline, essentially, um, and good aseptic technique. But um, if you look at what's been going on with COVID management, I mean, it's just frightening. It, they're doing the opposite of what would be good aseptic te technique. And it's crazy. When you think about it, there are some excellent world-class infection control specialists in Hong Kong. And of course, they've been completely muzzled because it's been a top-down, you must get this um, COVID outbreak under control, which of course with Omicron, which was more transmissible than its uh, predecessor variants, that's an impossible thing to do. So yeah, it's been a mismanagement on a, on a biblical scale. By by Xi Jinping and his uh, and it all it, it all goes back to him. He's the guy that you know. He's the chief executive. He's the guy that makes these decisions and tops down and give these orders. So I think he'd be under enormous pressure at the moment. Well, it may be a biblical scale, but good thing for China is that they've already had practice rewriting the Bible. <laughs> yeah, well, hundred percent. Well, so speaking of this, because um, this does kind of tie back to Australia, the idea that. Um, you know, the problem with everything happening in China now is is Xi Jinping. Uh, you know, that's something that was really pushed forward by the longer telegram, which many people suspect was Kevin Rudd, right? Yeah. Uh, who And what was his position? He, he's, he used uh, to he's be former, former prime, prime minister, minister of Australia. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, if that is, it's true. And so you, you have this kind of um, thread going about that, you know, the problem isn't the CCP, it's, it's Xi Jinping. How much is that really playing out in Australia with, you know, the likes of Kevin Rudd pushing that? Yeah, Kev, Kev the Rev, I call him. He's, um, he's a character. I remember going to a lecture he gave when he was shadow opposition. Uh, he was the opposition uh, foreign affairs spokesperson. And I was really impressed with him. I thought um, he came across quite differently as he did in the media at the time. 
And he's a very bright guy, and he, he's he's um, a good boffin in terms of uh, China analysis. But um, do you guys do you guys know what he's up to these days? He's head of the of Asia this? Society. Yeah, he right? actually exactly right. he actually introduced uh, the Anthony Blinken China policy speech. Right, mm-hmm. right, yeah. So he's been in that role for a couple of years now, and he's paid about a million US a year. Wow. And the Asia Society, the, yeah, the Asia Society is an interesting one because. Um, you know, some of the money for the Asia Society comes from people like Ronnie Chan, um, you know, the, hmm. the Hong Kong property tycoon who I've met, uh, had dinner with him in Nanjing. Now, yeah, he's an interesting guy. He is a, he's, a, he's a U.S. citizen, but he also has huge uh, business in China. Um, so, and it's also um, Tong Chi Hua is also, you know, a major sponsor or backer of the Asia Society. Big United Front guy. Well, he was, you know, he was the, the first um, chief executive of Hong Kong after the handover. So I think Ronnie Chan, um, I think Ronnie Chan loves America, but I think he's also uh, very proud of China's rise. I mean, Kevin Rudd, I've seen him interview Wang Yi, and he was he was respectful to the point of being deferential, you know, treating him with, uh, with kid gloves, as it were, um, really being the diplomat. And when you contrast Rudd's behaviour... Uh, in Australia, he has been relentless in his attack on uh, the previous administration, absolutely relentless to the borderline, you know, you can't worry about his mental health. And when he was Prime Minister, he was quite a controversial guy. He had a few complete meltdowns, like dummy spit meltdowns, you know, uh, when he was on uh, the Australian version of Air Force One over, over a sandwich that he was provided or something, something like that. And he famously came out of the uh, Paris climate negotiations and and there's a famous quote that I can't repeat on air, but he, he essentially said that the Chinese delegation had a, a bunch of some, some so-and-sos that had done so, something to us. You know, I'll leave you to fill in the blanks, but you get the idea. Um, so, you know, he had a reputation for alienating people. Um, he hates News Corporation. He's always raving on about News Corporation, even though when he was trying to get elected, he was only too willing to work the News Corporation. Um, so, yeah, Kevin, yeah, he's, he's a, a bit of an odd cat, let's put it that way. Uh, but, I, you know, he's also been, uh, you know, um, going to China with the, the Hank Paulsons of this world, you know, those those kind of guys that want to stay engaged. Um, but he won't be getting, I don't think he'll be getting any invitations anytime soon after his uh, comments on Xi Jinping. But Chris, I think you're right. I mean, Xi Jinping is one guy along the CCP journey, and I don't think uh, that journey is going to, that trajectory is going to change regardless of who's in power. It may be um, tweaked somewhat in in terms of, uh, you know, the, the intensity of what they're doing. They may adjust the settings, as it were, but I think the mission will stay the same because of the system, you know, she is uh, particularly Leninist in his approach. Um, but, uh, you know, I would suspect the system would continue. There's plenty more where he came from. What is interesting about things like the longer telegram is that it pretty transparently argues that we should get rid of Xi Jinping so that, like, maybe we can get a more normal CCP Go back like, like John Zeman, he was a totally normal person. <laughs> yeah, no. And I, and I, and yeah, I, I think. Go ahead. Yeah, I think it, I think it all goes back to uh, what Rush Doshi calls the three traumas: uh, Tiananmen, uh, the first Gulf War, and the collapse of the Soviet Union. So, um, in the heady days of Tiananmen, and as I mentioned, my first trip to Beijing was '88. I was back there in um, '90. So one year after Tiananmen, um, and I was I was in the morning. So I'd study at the Beijing Gaoji Guanli Chui and you know, the high level Carter mm, Institute, the cadre, yeah. <laughs> which was pretty interesting because I don't know what those guys studied, but they seemed to just hang around doing nothing most of the time. And um, and at night time, the, the students that were there, you'd hear these uh, beer bottles that were being broken, and that was sim- the symbolic around. Um, Xiaoping little bottles mm. and the idea was you know you were smashing <laughs> Deng Xiaoping it was a, it was a sort of campus protest against the crackdown in Tiananmen and oh, wow. um yeah back then um the beer bottles were um very brittle <laughs> I know because I did an internship at Foster's Brewing uh which was an adventure check this out 
This is the um, the uh, schizophrenic beer can. You see that? It's Shanghai beer, and it's it's Foster's on the other side of the can. So, and we have a little. Um, Wait, so so Foster's is actually Chinese for beer. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling you would go back to that ad campaign, which is you know the Australian for beer. That's a funny one because um. For many, many years, nobody has, uh, in Australia drinks Fosters, you know? Yeah, VB, everyone drinks VB uh, or Tui's or like, yeah. Uh, I, other stuff, yeah. other stuff, yeah. Yeah, I actually did a branding project for Craft Brewery in uh, Sokcho, Korea a couple of years ago. We ended up calling it Moon Bear. Um, I won, I won an uh, award at the Melbourne Design Awards. That's this whole separate uh, conversation, a little job I did for some private equity buddies of mine. Uh, we ended up losing control of the business anyway, but that's life. But yeah, this has even got this memorial can has even got a little inscription on it. You know, Genie, Genie and Audalia, it's only cheating. <laughs> Paul Keating went there and kind of cut the ribbon or whatever when they started. Wow. But the beer, bottle, beer bottles used to come along um, the factory and they used to just break after they'd been through, you know, cleaning and heating and all that stuff. Um, they make good beer bottles then now, but that was back in those days. Um, but in the afternoon, I'd go into the BHP office. I was, you know, the world's largest mining company. And back then, um, China was about 2% of its global sales. Japan was about 50% for iron ore. Um, and I'd go out to the Ministry of Metallurgy and Mining and um, I went out to Sh Shogun, you know, the Capital Steelworks. So, Chris, you mentioned that uh, the ski ramp in the Winter Olympics. Mm -hmm. Well, when I first saw it, I, I, I couldn't understand what part of uh, Beijing that was. But those two big chimney things, yeah, they were they were part of Shogun. Oh, so oh. open, right? That yeah, they were part of Shogun. So when I went out there, um, the Shogun, I kid you not, had one hundred thousand employees. It wow. was like a city. Yeah, it was like a city. So um, those SOEs have obviously been um, rationalised down or merged or whatever over the years, but. Um, you know, a year after Tenement compared to the year before, 88 was kind of the summer of hope, you know. Um, people were excited to see foreigners. In much of China, people had never seen a foreigner before. They just look at you and go, they just look at you and go, hey, La Wai. And, um, you know, so, you know, you know, La Wai, La Wai 86? Yeah. 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 Friend of your, friend of the show. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of La Wai 66, you know, so I'm kind of give, giving away my age there, but, um, you know, uh, it's just amazing to look back on those heady days and um, and how much it's transferred. In fact, I've known a ton of journalists over the years. Some of them have been my good friends. And um, on that first trip, I stayed with um, um, a family friend who was a China correspondent, Robert Thompson, and he's since gone on to become the CEO of News Corp, you know. Um, he was down here in Oz quite recently and caught up for dinner. But, um, yeah, it was very heady days. A year after Tiananmen, you could still see some tank tracks around, and and the BHP company, the company Peugeot, ended up with about six bullet holes in it, and they got it repaired, but they kept one of the bullet holes there just as kind of souvenir, mm. you know. But um, I remember being advised, do not get it, be in a taxi with a local, uh, particularly after dark. And um, when I when I went back to Beijing after my after Hopkins Nanjing, my studies there. I was I was um, I used to go past I used to go past um, Tiananmen every day to and from work, but um, you know the atmosphere in ninety versus eighty eight couldn't have been any more different. It was a sort of you know a, awakening of China, this excitement about opening up to the world again, because it had only been a few years into opening and reform, right? Yeah, and yeah, um, yeah. And particularly Shanghai. Um, I always associated Shanghai with being more welcoming to the outside world and Beijing being the commercial centre as opposed to the political centre. You look at the waterfront on the Bund and you sort of associate that with prosperity and openness to the outside world and all that sort of stuff. And when I was a little kid growing up, my next door neighbour, a Eurasian a kid, his uh, dad um, was one of those very wealthy family that fled um, Shanghai, um, you know, around 49 or thereabouts and moved down to Hong Kong. They had a monopoly on paper in Shanghai and um, they were so wealthy that my friend, um, he has photos of his grandparents with um, uh, William Holden and Cary Grant. <laughs> they had a whole building on the peak. So I, I kind of, um, 
you know, had had some clue about the channel and been around Chinese people since I was about five or six years of age, you know, uh, sort of connecting all these dots. Mm-hmm.